Please welcome Cecile Richards. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Nice audience. Oh, amazing audience. <laughs> <laughs> the best audience. Wow. Yeah. I have the best crowds. Uh, <laughs> the biggest crowds. The biggest crowds. Yes. All the biggest. But they never show my audience. <laughs> Look, show them now. They won't show my audience. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Uh, we had you on, uh, it was a year ago. Exactly a year ago. A year ago, and yes. that was just before uh, the Women's March that took place. In a year, how have things changed? Have things changed? And most importantly, how have they changed for women's reproductive rights? Okay, so yes, it's incredible that a year ago we didn't even know how the Women's March was going to turn out. Right. And it turned out, of course, to be the largest march in the history of the United States of America, which is pretty <laughs> exciting. Um, but I think most importantly, Trevor, it wasn't the end, it was the beginning. Right. And in fact, women have been ever since leading the resistance, they've been persisting, they've been showing up at town hall meetings. I think now, a year later, women are the most important political force in the United States of America. And that's really exciting. The march was big, but this year, um, uh, Donald Trump decided to make an appearance as the first president to make a, you know, visual appearance at the March for Life, which is opposed to everything that you do. Uh, we actually have a clip of something that he said. Could you play this here? Right now, in a number of states, the laws allow a baby to be born from his or her mother's womb in the ninth month. <laughs> it is wrong. It has to change. <laughs> This is... It's this shocking. Is, it's uncomfortable to ask, but is it yeah. true? Are babies being born from their mother's wounds? I think the shocking thing is it's been happening for centuries. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but... <laughs> But here's, here's this the thing. Is I, a, I mean, he, he says yeah. this, and I, look, I honestly don't believe he cares about any of it, which is no. why he didn't even notice he said it. But, but is, is this... This is a rumor that you hear all the time, that abortions are happening at nine months. Mm -hmm. And where is this happening and where is, where is this information coming from? Right. I, I mean, I don't know where he gets his information. It's absolutely not happening. Uh, and I, I think it's... Look, I think that this is a classic example of the danger of having uh, people in office, particularly people who cannot get pregnant themselves, making decisions about women's bodies and their lives. <laughs> and... Um, I mean, one of the interesting things that has happened, uh, and I have to, you know, harken back to when we had President Obama in office, who really supported women's health care access, we actually, because of that now, something like 62 million women now get birth control in this wow. country at no cost in their insurance plans, even though President Trump is trying to get rid of that. And uh, largely as a result, we now are at the lowest teen pregnancy rate ever in the history of the United States. <laughs> and... Um, we're at the lowest abortion rate since Roe was decided. And, and it's in large part because women are getting better access to, uh, to uh, family planning and birth control, and a lot of that at Planned Parenthood. Here's a question I have that I've, I've always struggled to understand, is why there, there seems to be a, a disconnect in an argument. Some people say um, uh, they, they aren't a fan of abortions, they don't want women having abortions, they don't want them, them to have the right to choose. Mm -hmm. But then those same people go, they don't want women having access to birth control, or they, right. they're opposed to this. Is there, is there a way that you can bridge this gap of people? Do they understand the connection between the two things? Uh, well, most of them do, but unfortunately, several of those folks are in Congress. And I do think it's important. Look, um, birth control, it's wildly popular. I'm just going to get it right out there. Um, more than 90% of women in this country use it. Right. Uh, but when we look at this administration, and you know, I mean, Planned Parenthood was in the crosshairs from day one. Yes. That's what they said. We're going to, you know, we're going to de defund Planned Parenthood. We're going to take away the Affordable Care Act. And has think, that happened? Actually, this is an important thing. Paul Ryan said that that bill was going to be on the president's desk uh, in, I think, early February of last year. And today it is January whatever. And I just will say, Planned Parenthood doors are still open all across the United States of America. <laughs> This year, uh, the Women's March, uh, one of the biggest gatherings was held in Las Vegas. And uh, Planned Parenthood was there, you were there. What was interesting was this year seemed to have a shift in a, in a focus. Mm -hmm. If last year was about mobilizing people to march and to voice right. their concerns, this year seemed like it was about getting people out to do now. Women to, right. to move into political positions, women running for office. Um, you, you had remarks that were really powerful for me. You, you said in your remarks about going out to vote, mm -hmm. 
that white women need to be better. White women specifically need to be better to black women. What did that mean? Well, I think, uh, yeah, uh, well, I'd love to actually, where it began, I think it is really important, just as a factual matter for folks to know, is that women of color in this country are the most reliable voters. They show up to vote, and when they do vote, they vote for people who support women's health and rights. And that's just something that is really important. Um, and so my point in saying that is, one, is to give credit for credit where credit's due and to say we need to invest in women of color uh, as candidates, as activists, as leaders. And also, the rest of us need to be doing more. And that is really to ensure that, look, I, I look at this November, uh, this coming election, women are poised to completely change the direction of Congress. And I think a lot of women are looking, looking at who's in office and saying, I could do better than that. Uh, and I, I just heard today, 30,000 women have uh, asked Emily's List to get training to run for office. Wow. That is historic. Wow. Uh, and so, um, so I do think it's important, though. We we need if if women, you know, if they register folks, if they educate them about what's at stake in elections, if they show up to the polls, uh, women will absolutely dominate in the November 18 elections, and it's about time. With so. with something that is so crucial, with a time that feels so crucial, you know, uh, we can't help but notice that you know there have been reports that came out. It was Buzzfeed, it was Politico saying Cecile Richards is stepping down from Planned Parenthood. Is, is now the time to step down? Does this feel like the right time to step away when it feels like everything is mobilizing? Well, I think it's, one, I'm not here to make any, you know, big announcements or pronouncements today. I think that uh, Planned Parenthood has never been a more important organization. And I have, you know, every day I'm president of this organization, I've been doing it now for 12 years, uh, I see the difference that we make in people's lives. And in fact, um, tomorrow morning, all across the, this country, in red states and blue states, Doctors and clinicians and patient escorts will wake up and they will open the doors and they will serve affordable health care to thousands of American people. And that, to me, is not only the legacy of this organization, but it's what we need to do going forward. And every day I get to play a role in that, it's, a, it's an honor of a lifetime. You dodged my question very effectively. <laughs> and I understand why. I, I, I know you, you have a board meeting coming up, but I... I I would want to know about your future as Cecile. I mean, everything comes to an end in life, and I don't know when that will be, but would you see yourself going into office? Maybe not 2018, maybe 2020 down the road. Maybe could you see yourself, yeah. could you see yourself going into office and w working to get into office in some way? You know, I don't know what all, I don't know what um, my future holds, but I do know that I've been fortunate to be kind of a troublemaker my whole life. Um, I was raised by a troublemaker, um, the late great governor of Texas, Ann Richards, and... Uh, <laughs> Um, as my friend, Congressman John Lewis, would say, good trouble, I hope. And yes. so whatever I do um, in my lifetime, I've always been incredibly privileged to be able to, I hope, make a difference in the lives of folks who may just need a break. And, and uh, so I, that, that's my hope. That's my hope for my future. Well, I wish you the best of luck. Thanks hey, so thank you, Trevor. Good to see you. <laughs> Cecile's memoir, Make Trouble, Standing Up, Speaking Out, and Finding the Courage to Lead, will be out this spring. Cecile Richards, everybody.